Really amazing work the two of you have done. Um, Kate, you've done a film. You, your directorial debut was um, Kidnapped for Christ, which follows the journeys of several American young people who were kidnapped. T tell a little bit about that film. Uh, yes, uh, Kidnapped for Christ was about uh, several teenagers whose parents sent them away to an evangelical reform school in the Dominican Republic. And the main student that we followed uh, was sent there after he came out to his parents as gay. Wow. wow. And it's won a number of awards. Uh, yes, we ran. Uh, we won the Audience Award at the Slam Dance Film Festival and several others, and it's airing on Showtime and also available on iTunes and Amazon Prime. Great, great, great. And Scott, you are a, a you kind of a long time Methodist family of ministers and uh, missionaries, and you actually did a family documentary. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I did a very small documentary about my own family called Planes, Trains, and Auto Rickshaws, which was <laughs> the, first, the first time kind of behind the camera making a documentary. And um, I'd never even planned to make documentaries, in fact, until my mother called me on the phone one day and said, I think I'm going back to India with my sisters. And so my mother and her sisters were born and raised in India and had not been back in 50 years. My grandparents were missionaries there. and, and uh, left a long legacy, and so I went to India with them and saw the Methodist churches that my grandfather and great-grandfather built and are still there, and it was, it was incredible. Wow. Wow. Well, what drew you to Frank's story? Why did, why did you two decide to make this? So we both live in Los Angeles and um, had worked on a project in the past. And so I heard Frank's story in the news like a lot of people after it, after it was already unfolding. I, I heard this story of a pastor who was being put on trial. The trial was going, it was going on at the time and he had been found guilty. And I was so blown away by this story, it was unlike anything I had ever heard. And I read more about how he had officiated his son's wedding and all these details. And I connected with it in such a deep way because my own father was a United Methodist minister in the Midwest for many years. And so I know what it's like to go to church every Sunday and see your, your parent behind the pulpit. And there is this kind of unspoken understanding as a child of a clergy person that when you are going to get married, your parent is going to officiate it because you see them officiate every wedding, you know, family members, friends, um, church members. So this story though exposed me to a side of the church that I knew nothing about. And it was, it was, I found it odd that I knew nothing about this side of the church that put people on trial and the book of discipline and, and all these rules that I knew nothing about because it was never talked about on a Sunday morning in my church. And obviously many people in the church are aware of this, but I felt that if, if I didn't know about this as somebody in the church, that many other people must not know about it. And I thought it has to be talked about. Okay, how about you? And uh, well, like Scott said, we had worked on a previous project uh, together, and when he approached me about wanting to do this film, I was just finishing up Kidnap for Christ, which really dealt with um, a lot of youth whose parents had rejected them for coming out as LGBT. And it was, it was refreshing to have a chance to work on a story um, that while it does show many people being um, either conflicted or rejecting the LGBT members of their church community, it also centered around a family that without question embraced their child. And that was really refreshing to me and I was happy to be a part of telling that story. And also, um, I'd gone to a relatively conservative evangelical college and watched many of my friends struggle with the fact that they were uh, gay or lesbian and not being able to come out and s while they were in college. and also wanting to be Christians. And I, I liked the idea that this was a story about people that 
did not feel that they had to choose between their orientation or accepting their children of a different sexual orientation and their faith. And so I think that's an important story to tell because it's often posed as an either or. You have to reject the church and be yourself and be LGBT, or you have to reject your sexual orientation in order to keep your faith. And I really believe that it's, it's not an either or, and that's an important story to tell for both sides. The story is such a, I mean, it's a very public church story, but Frank, I'm really struck, it, it's an intensely personal one. What was it like for your family to see their story on the big screen? What's it been like? Um, allow me to just say thank you to you and this congregation. I've heard so much about you guys. You are a beacon of light. Um, Glide Memorial UMC, I'm here, and it's, it's unreal, it's, it's amazing, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. This is, this is such an honor for me to be here, to be a part of this and actually see this and be with Pastor Karen and with Pastor Cecil earlier today, so thank you so much for this opportunity. And yes, it was, it was very personal, and um, I think when I, agreed um, when I talked with Scott first when he called me on the phone and I, I agreed to do this this documentary I didn't realize it was going to be this personal <laughs> he had and, no idea what he got himself into <laughs> I, I had no idea and uh, but you know um, I, I realized that that this this film is actually telling the story in such a powerful way, more powerful than I could ever tell it. And I did tell it in so many different places all over the United States. But it, it came out so powerful, um, you know, in the way Scott and Kate took the story and weaved it into the larger context and, and included uh, Jimmy Creech's story, who really has become like a father to me and who's also a member of this church, by the way. Yes, he is <laughs> Yes, he is a member of Glide uh, and, and Beth Stroud and so many others. So, um, yes, I think it's, it's totally worth it. Yeah. Um, I, I, this movie is, is, is kind of um, airs the church's dirty laundry, but there's a lot of church speak. Um, and yet, it's been, it's been featured and won awards in, in film festivals across the country. How, have you been surprised at how it's been received in the general public? I wouldn't say that I'm surprised how it's been received because, as we all know, I mean, the, the themes of the film go far beyond the Methodist Church. So the, the film centers on the Methodist Church. And, and that was a very conscious decision because to my knowledge, a, a feature documentary like this about the United Methodist Church had not been made before. And there are other great documentaries that are made, that have been made, uh, that are faith-based, about LGBT issues in other denominations, really great films that inspired me to make this one. Um, but so I, I felt like focusing on the United Methodist Church really, it goes so far beyond that. It's, it, it's the rest of the country. It relates to the rest of the world in so many ways. And the United Methodist Church is an international church too. So it really, it shows what's going on in other countries as well. Um, but we get, a, we get a real mix of people at these screenings. We're playing at a lot of United Methodist churches and, and some college campuses and film festivals. And I, I think we're playing in a retirement village in Chicago in a couple weeks. Um, we're playing in all sorts of places, which is really exciting. And there are a lot of people who have never set foot into United Methodist Church, or, or they'll come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I'm, I'm I was raised Jewish, but I'm an atheist, and I knew nothing about the Methodist Church, and I'm, I just love Frank Schaefer and what he did, and I'm so inspired by this story. I just think the message is, is so important for, for today. I think a lot of people who are not religious see only the you know, hateful Christians and the leaders that say things slanderously against the LGBT community. And this is a chance to show that the entire church is not like that that there are people yes. within congregations and within denominations and entire denominations that are affirming and progressive and in fact have been on the forefront 
of movements to be accepting to the LGBT community. And I think that's an important message too that the people who are, uh, have never been to church are also receiving from the film. I, I, I loved um, uh, Tom Lambrecht's hamburger theology. <laughs> I mean, did you catch that? You know, you can go to any McDonald's anywhere and get the same hamburger. And the United Methodist Church ought to be like, I mean, I, I, that's worth dissecting. I, and we have to have a few beers after this. Yes. Okay, okay. But, but I, I'm struck because cause you've done ministry, uh, you're from Germany, but done ministry on the East Coast. You've now come to the left coast. Um, how, talk about hamburger theology and the difference that you've seen in those locations and why those differences are critical. So quite contrary to Tom Lambrecht's idea of the United Methodist Church that should be uniform and have the same theology, I think the United Methodist Church, the way I've experienced it from the beginning, is that we are a diverse church. And we've always been proud of that very fact. Now, if if you look at other churches, like the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, they all have their systematic theology, right? They have, they have works by Calvin and by Luther and by the popes and all that. And it's, everything is just spelled out to the T, what you should believe and how it all works out in, in, in the theological universe. The United Methodist Church never had that. You know, what we have is Wesley's sermons, and his notes on Romans. And that's not systematic theology. And so as a result of that, we've always been a church that has prided itself on a, on a very broad theology. And we've always prided ourselves on being very diverse. And so I truly believe that that's who we are as Methodists and that we have been taken captivity, as uh, uh, the bishop said in the movie, uh, by, by the uh, religious rights. They have taken over on this issue and have really pushed us into, into a corner that we're not really part of, that we really don't belong to. So I, I, have, I am very hopeful that in the long run we're going to you know, show our true colors and come back out on the right side uh, of inclusion and diversity. So why, why, why is the church so unyielding? Why is this issue so, such, uh, fought so passionately? Oh, Karen. That's the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, I, what, from your from your view? Yeah, that that is the, why. Why? Why are they fighting? I I don't know. I I really don't know what. Where does homophobia come from? Why are people saying, you know, homophobic people in our church saying, well, this is different than the issue of slavery? I don't know. I really don't understand it because we changed our minds on, on slavery, obviously, even though there is plenty of biblical precedents for it. There are only six verses in the entire Bible that speak about, well, what they say is homosexuality, mm -hmm. what we probably wouldn't even acknowledge. And yet, and yet they're saying, no, 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 this is, this is the issue and we're not going to bend on this. I, I don't understand it. Honestly, I really don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Mm. So, so um, I, loved, I loved when you were talking about your call and that slow kind of coming to it, and then all of a sudden this booming voice. Um, you're now an activist for LGBT rights. Have you heard that booming voice? Oh, I think that booming voice I heard very clearly during uh, or leading up to my trial. Um, because it is true, at one point, I was actually thinking that if, if they defrock me over this, if the church defrocks me over this, um, that, that's it for me and, and organized religion. I won't have any part in it anymore. And what happened was, as soon as the story became public, there was an outpouring of support. Hmm. An outpouring of support of churches like Glide and Foundry and so many others, individuals, other denominations. Um, I was like, oh my God, we're not the only ones. <laughs> 
uh, because I felt so isolated. All my, all my years in Lebanon County, I felt so isolated and that it felt like I was, I was the only one. And, and I had to sort of like be very careful in what I said and all that. And as soon as this support was poured out over me and my family, I, I, I sense this is a calling from God. God has given me a baton and I'm going to run with it. I'm going to run with it and I'm going to, I'm not going to keep back. I'm not going to be silent any longer. And, and I re, you know, there were times when, when I was asked by my church members that I had served for 11 years. And, and now they ask me concretely, you know, what do you think about gay marriage and all that? And, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to be totally honest. And I, I told them what I thought, and I said, there's nothing wrong with it. And I told them my theology about it. I told them about my children and what I believed in was in my heart. But you know, it was really difficult. It was almost like, because in a sense, I had kept that from my congregation for so long. It was almost like a, a coming out for me. Mm. And I heard those words that I was saying to my church folks then through their ears. And as these words came out, even though I knew in my heart, these, you know, this is the truth, it felt like blasphemy because I listened to those words through their ears and their minds. And it was, was really, really hard. But I, I knew at that moment that this was a calling from God, that, that I had to bring this message to the entire world. Because what's, what was happening was that people like my son, are being harmed by the church's doctrine every single day. And, and there are many who aren't as fortunate as my son. There are many, especially teenagers, who do take their lives, and it has to stop. We're going to take some questions from you all, but um, at this time I want to invite our associate pastors, Reverend Theon Johnson III and Reverend Angela Brown forward. Will you welcome them? Be thinking of questions you, you have for our guests tonight. How have you enjoyed what you've seen tonight and been a part of? And we want to do more of this, but the only way we can do that is for you to help us with that. We know that we need to have more conversations like this on different topics, because that's where change begins, simply by having conversations like this. So I'll turn it over to Theon, and he can tell you how you can help us make that happen. Thank you so much for choosing, for saying yes to being here. Uh, we're happy that you are a part of this radically inclusive community that's just and loving and mobilized to alleviate suffering and marginality. That's what we seek to do here at Glide every single day. And so we need your help. I'm going to invite you to do something that we do every single Sunday for those of you who are visiting. Um, we, we invite you to, to, everybody, take your hand. Everybody's hand up, hand up. Hand up, hand up, seriously, hand up, hand up. <laughs> to the windows, to the windows. Windows over here, windows are right there. Here we go, to the wall, there you go, to the windows, wall. Up high, up high, up high. Reach down into your pocket. It's not <laughs> Pull out your cell phones, ah. <laughs> And if you do not have them on already, we, we invite you to turn them on, take them out. You will see a QR code here on the back and some flyers in uh, the back pockets of the pew. But we want you to help us um, keep these conversations going. We want you to help us to support these critical conversations that inform and amplify our daily work. We want you to support these services that happen every single day here at Glide. And so we invite you to assist us in our tilt campaign, which is give an act of love to Glide. Will you help us? Will you help us? Will you help us? We need your help, so we invite you to take your phone and also take a look at this um, website, and if you would please help us meet our funding goal by donating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What you need to know is you saw the Judicial Council meet to talk about Frank's status. Um, 
We have someone who served on the Judicial Council until she became clergy, and that's Angela Brown. And she just switched her status, otherwise she would have been making a decision about you. So Angela's running again for Judicial Council, so keep her in your prayers, because in May, people will be voting whether or not she'll return to that, so. Uh, I want to give you a chance. It's not very often we get um, Frank and Kate and Scott with us. So if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone over to you. And Yes. Stick up. Good evening, Reverend. Um, a question. Could it sound like um, the Methodist is, you're stuck in the Wesley um, error with your theology and stuff. Um, and if things don't go well at your general um, synod, your next conference, can you see a um, split within the Methodist Church? And are we maybe a bigger picture heading toward another Reformation era um, within the total church history? A lot of times I get asked that question about the split and, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm sort of split about that answer to that question because a part of me is saying, you know, sometimes in a bad marriage, a separation isn't the best, isn't the worst thing that could happen, uh, especially if there are children involved. And, and in, in our case, you know, we're talking about children, teenagers really being harmed. And so in, in some sense, I agree maybe a split would be the best thing. On the other hand, I'm thinking, no, we are a church of God, and, and we have to get this right. There is no reason for us not to get this right. There, there has to be a way, and so I'm really praying, hoping and praying desperately that there will be change. At, general conference in May, which is coming up so soon. Um, you know, humanly speaking, if you look at the makeup of the delegates that have been sent or chosen and will be at general conference, humanly speaking, it, it doesn't look good. But our God is a God of possibilities. And so I am, I am begging, I am praying to God that we will see a change coming out of General Conference. If it's not gonna happen or if, if it's not going to be enough, it's going to be devastating for our church, I know that. But I'm, I'm still hoping. I, I'm still hoping that we will get this right and that something can be done. Question over here. Hi, my name is Matt and uh, I'm a, well, Presbyterian, but don't tell anyone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm getting married in November, and I am a sixth-generation um, Methodist Texan, I suppose, who has found hope outside of the Methodist Church for my um, partner and myself. Um, my Methodist grandmother won't come to our wedding uh, in November, and uh, I wondered what words of John Wesley you'd share with her to try and change her heart. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last. The words of John Wesley you might share with her to change her heart. Words of John Wesley that you might use to, to change her change heart. Change her heart about attending him and his partner's wedding. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm totally missing this. I'm, can you? So, so uh, to, to help change the, her mind, mm -hmm. what John Wesley, what, what, how would you use John Wesley's words? Oh, I see. To, to help her realize this is within the faith. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, if you study John Wesley's life and his ministry and his words, I think it becomes very clear that John Wesley would have absolutely been on the side of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters 100%. In fact, there was, there was one uh, case where he actually showed up in court in support of a gay man and spoke favorably of him and spoke out for him. Uh, so that's another reason why I don't understand why the other side uh, is, is saying that, that the United Methodist Church should you know, side 
with the homophobes and with with those who are opposed to gay marriage. I, I just don't get it because if, if you really look at John Wesley's life, that's the only conclusion I can come to. He would have supported um, LGBTQ rights 100%. I, I think a really good quote is, is the one that, that starts the film. Oh, and, yeah. And to, to paraphrase, it's, it's a well-known quote. Um, though, though we cannot all think alike, don't we all love alike? Um, though we are not all of one opinion, are we not of one heart? And that's where the quote leaves off at the beginning of the film, but the next thing he says, you know, surely we can, surely we can be of one heart, though we do not think the same way. My question to you is, I love the movie, but how much of this movie is being shown in the African American community churches in the South? where the Bible Belt is really <laughs> bad, <laughs> putting it nicely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we are playing in a number of churches around the country. Um, I know we are, this, this film was played in an adult Sunday school class in Birmingham, actually, for over about a month, they, they split the film into sections and taught this in Birmingham, and I'm in touch with some other folks in, in Birmingham that, that are interested in, in hosting a screening there as well. Um, we're going to be playing at a film festival coming up in, in Arkansas. Um, so we are playing more churches in California on the West Coast where we see more progressive churches. So, but fortunately, we are getting into a few more conservative southern areas. And so we are part of the it's Time campaign, which Reconciling Ministries Network has put on leading up to General Conference. And part of that campaign is to get churches to host screenings and hold discussions exactly like this. And they have different regional organizers. One of them who is here, Izzy, is our, is our West Coast organizer who's Izzy been amazing Alvaron, in helping us to get screenings. Stand. Yeah, there he is. Reverend Izzy Alvaron. Openly gay Filipino pastor, United Methodist. Great work, great organizer. <laughs> and so there, there are organizers in each region of the country, and there is an organizer who is focused on the Southeast in particular in getting screenings of this film. So we are focused on that. It, it's coming slowly, but it is happening, and we're playing a number of film festivals, churches, college campuses. Um, but if if you all know anyone that you feel should see this film in their church, in their communities, it's very simple to host a screening, actually, just like Glide did. You can go to our website, anactoflovefilm.com, and we have information on how you can host a screening. So please tell your friends anywhere in the country that they, too, can see this film. Another question. Um, yes. Um, I um, have to admit I'm also a Presbyterian. <laughs> um, but I've traveled around a lot. I travel almost continuously, and I spent last year in Georgia working a political campaign, and I saw the weirdest thing. I saw a Republican business owner stand up and talk about LGBT rights as part of trying to switch a district from um, Democrat to Republican, and they actually succeeded in doing that. And um, and then I would see these so-called progressive people saying, well, you know, this isn't, you know, biblical to support homosexual marriage. And I'm wondering, you know, when I watch a documentary, um, I feel like I'm watching a political drama and not a religious yeah. thing. And, um, and, I, and, and I, I can't wrap my mind around, I'm like, why do people say progressive versus conservative when uh, people can be conservative you know, like Dick Cheney has said that he would never disown his daughter. Condoleezza Rice has said, my best friend is gay. You get what I'm saying? Like, I, I, like, I don't know how it's progressive or, you know, a conservative issue. What, what is it with people in this whole idea that, well, you have to fit into this category or fit into that category or be outside or be inside? Why can't we just be ourselves and have something? I mean, I guess I should say that I'm trans, but I don't know how that matters. You get what I'm saying? It's just mm -hmm. what, like, 
how can going forward, can people come to a place where it's like, well, you know, this isn't a conservative or progressive issue, but it's an issue about, well, you know, you can be a, I've met conservative lesbians and, you know, they're just as conservative as anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, how can we navigate that going forward? Great. Um, I would say I, I myself have been in and out of communities where I felt like I was the insider and the outsider as well. I grew up in a very liberal family and out of rebellion became an evangelical Christian. Then I went to an evangelical college and realized that I was liberal and, and made a film about a gay teen getting rescued from an evangelical reform school. So granted, that's been much easier for me because I've made those choices. Um, but I sympathize with the fact that, you know, progressive and, and liberal and conservative and homophobic or bi bigoted are not these black and white terms and we're not usually divided along these neat lines, nor should we be. And to me, I, I, I think it's a good thing when a, a Republican can be fighting for LGBT rights. Mm -hmm. In as much as sometimes it pains me to see progressives not fight for LGBT rights, it's like, to me, LGBT rights should really be viewed as human rights, and it's not, it shouldn't be a political issue. Um, and like everything else from, you know, minority rights, LGBT rights, women's rights becomes political issues because there are groups of people that power can be wielded over and blocks of people that their votes can be gained from. When it comes to the church and other communities of people on the local level, I mean, I think we're wise to leave as much of that behind as we can. And so I don't, I wish I had an answer to your question. There's not a clean cut answer. Like there just isn't. But at the end of the day, I, I'm really inspired by communities like this that can leave behind a lot of this, this baggage from society. And it doesn't matter what gender you are or what orientation you have or whether you've changed those things or whether you've changed your point of view. It's like, at the end of the day, are you helping your fellow man? Are you making your community better? Are you making the people around you and yourself healthier and happier? And I don't, I think all I can speak for all of us that like, it doesn't matter what, what religion you identify as or what orientation you have or what church you go to as long as that is the result of what you're doing. So that probably doesn't answer your question at all, but I got on my soapbox and so there's that. But I, I get you, I get you. These lines we divide between us are often really arbitrary and don't, don't help us to come together very often. Okay. And also I want, I want to add to that, um, you know, I was, I was sort of astounded when I came to California that uh, I have friends now that are Republican and yet are socially totally progressive. Uh, and are totally inclusive uh, of LGBTQ rights. And, and so I think we have to be careful not to um, jump categories. So if we talk political conservatism or liberalism, that's different from religious conservatism and liberalism or progressivism. So I think we need to be careful not to put everybody in, just because they're politically conservative doesn't mean they're also socially or, or theologically conservative as well. I think we have to be careful with that. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a very good point. Another question. I'm a recovering Catholic. I guess we're doing a poll. Stand up. So I'll oh, stand up. So um, I think my question is to everyone. Scott started to answer it. And you know, we're in the main, in big cities, we're very progressive. And I think the message is delivered and it's accepted and, and it's in major cities all throughout America. Um, but how can we sprinkle change in rural America through, um, through not only the pulpit, but also through the media? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and for me, the, the way I try to do that is the way I know how, and it's telling stories like this, telling powerful stories. Um, the this, this story of two parents accepting their, their gay son 
or lesbian daughter is, as we were saying, is not, not a partisan decision to accept your children. I think, it's, I think it's very simple. And so I was very careful in making this film to not judge anybody in the film at all, either side, um, whether I personally agreed with what they were saying or not. Because I want this film to be safe to play in much more conservative communities that may not agree with everything that's in the film, but they might agree with a few people. Um, so that's, that's one way that I have, I have found is a powerful tool, is, is storytelling. Um, the, sharing the human side of some of these debates. You can argue law, you can argue theology, you can argue the book of discipline, but those, those are words on a page, but those words affect people. And it's very different to look someone in the eyes and, and say, I don't accept you. It's, it's, it's very hard to do that. Um, and so that, that's one way that, that I, I have found is telling stories like this. I say like a lot of people, um, a lot of people discriminate out of fear or hate, but a lot of people also end up discriminating out of like strangely good intentions. Like a lot of people would say that they think being homosexual is a sin or they can't support gay marriage because it's not in that person's best interest. And that's more like they're discriminating out of ignorance. And the way to fight ignorance is to tell a different story and let people see that story, identify with it, and give them a new perspective. And I think that's where stories like this and other, and celebrities and people who come out in public can give people an alternative narrative that can break them out of the cycle of ignorance so that they can actually express the love that really is in their heart in the first place. We have, we have uh, two more questions here and over here. Hi, I'm a former United Methodist minister, and I surrendered my credentials instead of going through a, a trial. And I just want to acknowledge that Karen went through a terribly abusive trial, and we're blessed. Not a trial, that not she, a trial. Oh, just okay. a complaint. A complaint. But she risked her ministry for this cause, and I want to acknowledge that and uh, voice my appreciation. My question has more to do with the leadership or lack thereof of the bishops. And I remember when you had your trial, I was just appalled by Bishop Johnson and some of the the cowardly actions that I think she took in. Mm -hmm. And I really think the way in which your trial was stacked against you, that I think there was not, uh, wasn't there a huge limit of the number of witnesses and things like that? Yeah. And then we have somebody like Bishop Talbert, who is, you know, I think really going to change the church on this. I just wonder what your thoughts are about the fact that the conferences seem to be ab avoiding trials now. And um, have you had any communication with Bishop Johnson? Has this changed her at all? Has do you see it changing other bishops, especially listening to Bishop Talbert? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, don't get me started on the subject of bishops. <laughs> <laughs> there are some that are so wonderful, as you mentioned, Bishop Talbert, and of course, Bishop Carcano, and, and there are others that are very supportive, and there are some that are very outspoken, like. Bishop Talbert and Carcano, and others that are silently supportive, and, and that's really appreciated as well. But then there, there are bishops like my former Bishop Johnson, uh, who privately told me that she is on my side and on the side of the LGBTQ community, but then was pressured by conservatives in her own conference and outside of the conference to a point where she feared that if she didn't let this go to a trial that she would be on the bench next to me. That's, those are words that she actually said to me. She feared she would be sitting on the bench next to me and she couldn't help me from that position, but she could help me if she was still the bishop. But then in the end, she ended up not helping me at all. <laughs> um, on the one hand, I feel 
for Bishop Johnson and other bishops that feel pressured and I feel sorry for them. On the, but on the other hand, I don't understand it because there are people being harmed, their own flock, and aren't they supposed to be the shepherd of all of their people? And if there are people being harmed by the doctrine of the church and by people in the church, they have to speak out. They have to speak out, and they can't hide behind the delegates and the democratic process and all that. When there are people being hurt, they ha hurt, they have to stand up with them and for them and do something about it. That's my opinion. Thank you. And Hi. Um, my question is, uh, if you could tell us three types of action or three types of um, of act activism or support that you would want for everyone who watched your film to do, whether they were part of the church or not, uh, what would it be? Great. 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 So there are so many things that, that you can do, um, especially right now as we, we lead up to General Conference. Um, actually, the Reconciling Ministries Network has a whole list of things where you can get involved in one way or another. Um, it, it starts at just being vocal on your own Facebook and social media pages and, and outlets um, over um, actually signing up to be at General Conference, to, to hand out flyers and to protest whatever is needed, uh, to writing letters to your delegates, um, to those that are voting delegates at General Conference, to your bishops, to really put pressure on them, or even involve your local politicians and the, the media. And there are so many more suggestions and so many more things that you can sign up to do. Um, just recently, um, if you go on RMN, they put out um, actually a form that you can fill out. You just have to fill in your name and your email address, uh, which is like a pre-printed letter to your delegate. Um, and so you can actually do that online. Uh, or actually, it was a letter to all the delegates as a, you know, as a, as a, as a union, all what? 850 uh, 800, delegates. Yeah, over 850. Eight, yeah. Eight, 850. Eight, yeah, eight, yeah, a little more. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, yeah, so a, lo a lot of what you're asking is, is part of the It's Time campaign with Reconciling Ministries Network. You can go to their website and find information on how you can take action. Um, I do want to say that, you know, we as filmmakers, we're, we're trying to do our part to inspire people, not just in churches like Glide, but, but churches around the world of all different opinions. And one thing that we decided to do a very long time ago was to, even before the film comes out to the public on DVD, which it is not yet, to send pre-screeners of this film to all the delegates of General Conference. So I know Pastor Karen probably got one in the mail. I did um, as a delegate. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing that we have done. We feel like, like this film and these stories and these people in this film and what they are doing and what they represent are so important and, and need to be in front of these delegates because in two months it all boils down to 864 some voting delegates around the world. Right for the next four years of church law. And, and feel free to go to Portland. Um, I know Pastor Theon will be there, Pastor Angela will be there. I'm a delegate. In 2000, I was arrested. It, you saw me in the floor breaking things up out there um, in 2012. But um, witness makes a difference. So if you have time to go to Portland, I want to thank you three. We at Glide, you know, please. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We at Glide. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we you. at Glide know the importance of story. And so you just embodied one of our core values. So thank you. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you for telling Frank so boldly. I want to first, before you leave, take a seat. I just want to introduce you to a couple of people. If you volunteered, if you are a volunteer tonight, will you please stand so we can thank you? We had a lot of people volunteering. And if you were staff, 
If you were staff, will you please stand because we couldn't do this without you, staff. And a special shout out to Dory who makes things happen here, Dory. Reverend Izzy Alvaron, who brought this to us uh, from RMN. I want to thank him. And again, a special thank you to Scott, Kate, and Frank. Thank you so much for your witness, for the power of your storytelling. And I hope this gets out more and more and more. Thank you so much.